you know, for as long as I can remember, I... <laughs> Actually, wait, there's a... There's something I've always wanted to do here. <clears throat> Banished from Earth, Viewbop broadcasts from his bedroom in Oneonta on his never-ending mission to review everything. Anyway, for as long as I can remember, I've been a futurist. From visions of robot assistants to flying cars, I've often found myself looking to days beyond. Better times. One thing's for sure, though. The future has got to be fashionable. Sure, all this gorilla glass and stainless steel works in practice, but minimalism is miserable. Future! Checkpoint! I want a future where we use giant, silly digital SLRs with AI chips in them who insult my moon photography in a high-pitched voice. I want wood grain DeLoreans and standalone music players with a printed Sega Saturn design on the back. Because the Sega Saturn rules! Maybe this pension for the future comes from just watching too much Samurai Jack as a kid, but I think it also comes from my dissatisfaction with my own zeitgeist throughout my life, often to a ridiculous degree. You know, as a shaggy-haired ten-year-old who fist-bumped at 70s nostalgia memes, perhaps my brightest burning fuel was a hope that one day my future would be just as cool as a past I never got to experience, one that I so desperately longed for. One of the biggest beacons of this future I dreamed of would come in the form of a little video game review show, Classic Game Room. In 1999, and fresh out of film school, friends Mark Bussler and David Crisson found themselves involved in a startup called From USA Live. The idea was to create an internet TV channel, bringing a more democratic approach to public access television nearly six years before YouTube. One of the shows broadcast on this site would be Bustler and Croissant's own The Game Room, a panel-style video game review show years before Hard for Games. To call these early episodes rough would be an understatement. The main bad guy's name is wonderful. Yeah. His Balzac. Name, his name is Balzac. That just, uh, I don't know. What were they thinking? I'm That's an, all I have to say. I'm an evil Balzac. <laughs> Considering this lack of appeal and the fact that only about a quarter of American households had internet going into 1999, From USA Live went under quickly. However, I don't think they were just starry-eyed late 90s tech hopefuls. Because less than a year later, a team of maverick stoners working for the Cartoon Network would leverage the relative niche that was the internet to find their audience. Figuring that like-minded weirdo geeks would be hanging out online, they farmed analytics from early internet email surveys and created the original lineup of Adult Swim shows. I can't help but think From USA Live, however less funny, was trying a similar approach. Nevertheless, From USA Live proved to be a bit too ahead of its time and the founders went their separate ways. Mark would go on to make direct-to-video historical documentaries, collaborating with talents like Gene Wilder, and covering topics from the world's fairs, to His compatriot David would go on to... to become a senior pharmaceutical director at Willis Towers Watson in insurance firm headquartered out of London, huh? Well, anyway, Mark would go on to direct many a DTV documentary and really cultivated his journalistic voice. A few of his films would see rather frequent broadcast on PBS. However, as the new millennium trod through its first decade, DVD sales began to decline. Just as this was happening, a whole new world of free online video streaming began to emerge. One of Mark's old publicists found himself posting from USA Live shows on a new site called YouTube, and in particular the game room got great feedback. I can't imagine why. The original plan was just to release a supercut of game room episodes as a mockumentary called Classic Game Room, the rise and fall of the internet's greatest review show. But as Mark got back into the groove of making videos about video games, he found himself really enjoying it. And on February 20th, 2008, a new incarnation of the game room was born. This show is a more relaxed version of classic game room. This is a look back at 20 to 30 years of video gaming history. What we're looking at here is Zaxxon for the Atari 2600. In the From USA Live days, 
the game room could coast on the fact that they were probably the only people on the internet, on video, publicly talking about video games new and old. But in this new YouTube world, Mark had competition. The likes of Angry Video Game Nerd and all of the normal boot shows arose to drink his milkshake! To drink it up! Mark instead had to focus on his differentiators. Firstly, a low-energy, dreamlike atmosphere. Next, a focus on retro games. While everyone else was arguing over that PS Triple, not that Nintendo Wii, Mark would make nostalgic odes to his favorite time in gaming. The 90s! Furthermore, and perhaps tired from half a decade of straightforward historical narration, Mark would introduce some sci-fi space theming into his reviews, projecting a far space age where wood grains and brain people ruled all. Mark expected an audience of wistful Atari expats, and they came in droves, but what he hadn't accounted for was kids like me. Me who would have been newly six years old when that first installment went live. The children of CGR. Look. I'll talk a lot to whoever will listen about early YouTubers who influenced my videos and sensibilities, right? You know, my humor is influenced a lot by Smosh and Ashens. My voice and interest in the obscure come a lot from people like Hard for Games and JonTron. But CGR really laid the groundwork for who I am, man. It's all a bit cool and dry, a bit dreamy and sardonic, but showing through that humor is a genuine love for the arts and a joy of life. Even in 2011, Mark channeled perhaps a more intellectual and irreverent side of the internet, slowly even then being silenced by the overly serious and bitter. Kids like me who would watch anything that had to do with video games stumbled upon CGR, not knowing the first thing about the Atari 2600 or the Vectrex, but it didn't matter. The videos were so cool, they were oddly relaxing and meditative, and they portrayed a space-age future where the old was cool again, anything in the name of fun. That was a world I wanted to live in then, and I tell you what, it still sounds like my kind of future. Like I said at the top, as a kid I really grew to hate the current age I was living in. Whatever that means. It gets overlooked in how memed on the born in the wrong generation comment is, something I'm not wholly innocent of by the way, but it's really a hopeless feeling out of placeness. In our ever more connected age, not only do you have to reckon with your own loneliness, but the rosy tinted recollections of strangers older than you. In those rough years caught between elementary and high school, the bullying and isolation felt even worse when compounded with the ever sinking feeling that if only I'd been born 20 years older, this would all be easier. Of course, that would all prove to be nothing more than growing pains, but as an outcast preteen who prefers looking into the stars in a tomb all his own looking out over a culture of Skrillex and Drake, of newly emerging cringe culture and hate for profit social media, fear of the present was an unstoppable force. All of this is to say, shows like CGR gave me hope. It was the first time I'd ever considered that there were others like me, and tons of them apparently. Maybe if we all tried, really, really hard, we could make a future just like the one on YouTube. A future where we could all live the lives we wanted, loudly at that, maybe. Slowly but surely, all that hope vanished like leaves from a late fall oak. In an ever polarizing internet, troves of story time videos, clapbacks, savage comments, takedowns, and video essays proclaiming to tell you the truth that the powers that be were hiding, Smosh disbanded. JonTron slowed to a crawl, and classic game room died off. Not before entangling itself in a mess of battles with YouTube and seemingly its own fans until it all became too much to watch. Even if I was kind of on Mark's side the whole time, the message was clear. Futurism, hope, and genuine joy had no place in today's world. That was kitty shit. Now we make fun of 11 year olds and discuss drama till we're blue in the face. Everything sucks, and we've irrevocably lost something from the brighter days of the past. Something we can never regain. My middle school angst was right all along. And like, you try and stay positive, right? That's what I did. As all my peers were fetishizing malaise, I tried to smile for days ahead. And just as things were genuinely starting to look up, the exciting dawning of a new decade where we could all right the wrongs of the past and create a happier culture, 
A fucking world-altering pandemic hits, doing irrevocable damage to the very fabric of society and setting us back years on all that progress that was ever so palpable. Only then, seeing my friends and idols fall into the despair of the pandemic did I truly feel hopeless for the future. New music lost its touch, new YouTube and television shows started to feel more and more stale. I perhaps even felt more out of touch than in middle school. I couldn't see it then. But even the coldest winter eventually thaws, life returning to the deadest of dogwoods. And so it was that something funny began to happen around the summer of 2023. I shit you not, it all began with the announcement of Frog Brigade's reunion tour. And, and like, Oysterhead may or may not have caused the pandemic, but, but that's a story for another video. So of course it would take another Les Claypool band to dig us out of that hole. But right around last summer, I felt the tides beginning to change. I started seeing tech videos about using less social media. Video essays about how drama addiction, a coin everyone was starting to use, was damaging us. The real measure of it, I've been starting to see memes, unlike Instagram, about being dissatisfied with cringe culture and embracing who you are, and to riotous applause in the comments. High school aged view Bob's head would have exploded. Then out of suddenly nowhere, Smosh announced that they were getting back together to produce videos, to even more applause. It was a summer of new beginnings for me personally, but also one of nostalgia, helped along by my newfound love of Boards of Canada. It was in this nostalgia that I found myself looking for a particular piece of YouTube merch I so coveted as a child. Here, you, you see this CGR glass? I wanted one of these so bad as a kid, but for obvious reasons could never convince my parents to buy me one. Well, as a newly minted adult with disposable income, I looked to the old CGR channel just for a link and rejoiced as a then brand new upload showed off a new run of insert beer output fun glassware. What great timing. Hey, wouldn't it be funny if, if CGR were, were to come back too? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. What's, what's that? Is that? No. It, is that seven new classic game room videos? Once it, exactly in the same style as the old videos with perhaps even a more delicious vibe, coupled with the promise of an entirely new season in 2024? I think I'm gonna faint. <laughs> this initial run of new episodes is just awesome. They managed to recapture that bizarre, lucid vibe of the original CGR so well, but all that futuristic hope is replaced with perhaps a lonelier vibe. That cheesy, sunshiny stock music of the original is replaced with Bustler's own compositions, a bleak and cold synthwave soundscape of androids and pocket operators. Mark's more low-key delivery takes on a whole new meaning, juxtaposed not only with this new musical identity, but the collective journey we've all been on over the past decade. Like his audience, Mark has seen the future he desperately longed for come just into grasp before we all got spiritually beamed into the R zone. It's at once cathartic and empowering seeing so many fellow travelers on a journey which I believe myself to be alone. Beneath all that though, and through all the abandonment issue driven fan skepticism that this resurrection of the show might be just as swiftly cancelled as the last, it has an immutably hopeful meaning to me. I think as kids, we're always told that everything is only a moment in time by all the smart grown-ups, but we have no real concept of it, right? We're far too young to have seen anything go by, or else too young to care. It's only when we get older that we could fully appreciate what left us. Well here, I've got a rare opportunity to appreciate this childhood dream in real time. Even if it's only for a moment, it's a moment I'm going to give the proper appreciation to. Space God Truxton so help me. So, I wrote most of this script around January, and it was meant to end there. Thanks for checking in guys, have a great night, I'll see you next time, and all that. Well, a few shamrock shakes later, it seems the aforementioned fan fears about CGR being preemptively cancelled once again have been realized. Just recently, as of recording, Mark all but officially confirmed that CGR's last few episodes are upon us, even confirming as much to me in an email. You know what though? 
And maybe I've just changed, but this doesn't feel as gutting to me as the last time this great show stopped uploading. For one thing, Mark's not leaving us completely this time. He's pushing full steam ahead with Omega Ronin, issuing a full suite of CDs. And if we're lucky, maybe there'll even be a podcast or some behind-the-scenes uploads or something cool like that. Secondly, I did just what I set out to back at what was supposed to be the end of this video. I have fully appreciated the weekly return of my childhood favorite YouTuber. My Friday nights after work have been filled with so much joy and wonder, taking in this rare treat out of its own time. It's genuinely made me reflect on myself a lot. Hell, I probably wouldn't be writing anything for this YouTube channel right now if it weren't for the run we did get. And at the risk of sounding a bit overdramatic, this show's return has caused my life to get exponentially better. And that's something that's never going away. And really, neither are my memories with the Intergalactic Space Arcade. Classic Game Room may not be following me into my future, but there still will be one. And all I can do is take its spirit with me and try to create my own bright future. One I want to live in. And for real this time. I sure can't wait for those space bees. Congratulations!